Good evening, everyone. I'm David Cash. I'm the Dean of the John W. McCormick Graduate School of Policy and Global Studies. It's wonderful to have you all here tonight on this event that's uh, uh, co-sponsored by the Office of Community Partnerships and the Office of Career Services and uh, the Alumni Office in University Advancement. We're really excited to be talking about public service tonight and uh, the path through the McCormick Graduate School that got two luminaries, two alum luminaries uh, into public service. And, um, and, and this is a particularly um, poignant time, I think, to be having this discussion. We've come out of four years where public service, I think, was questioned and derided in ways that I never in my lifetime saw or thought that it could. We've seen some courageous public servants, even in the last couple of weeks, men and women who have counted and counted and counted ballots, men and women who have made sure that our votes count, men and women who have courageously stepped up to uh, unheard of and unprecedented political pressure in this country. Um, and that's just one example of the kind of public servants we have, whether it's in our public health sphere, in governing, in aging services, in uh, community service. Um, it, it's, um, it's a uh, foundation of the McCormick Graduate School to educate leaders in this, uh, in this way. We have a wonderful cast of folks who are gonna speak with you tonight and I'm not gonna introduce them all, that will happen throughout, but I do wanna just kick this off. Uh, first, by thanking uh, Rochelle Straker and Jack Lee, folks on our staff in McCormick who made this all happen. Uh, you received emails from them. They got all the tech working. They made sure everything uh, uh, is working just fine. So I really want to appreciate that. Um, and then uh, uh, the person whose idea this was to have these kinds of events is Cynthia Oriana. She's the director of the Office of Community Partnerships at UMass Boston. And why don't I hand it over to you, Cynthia? Thank you, Dean Cash. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to, to all of you who joined us today. Uh, and to our special guests, Secretary Elizabeth Chen and Leslie Stevenson, whom you'll hear from in just a moment. Um, as Dean Cash said, I'm Cynthia Orellana, the Director of the Office of Community Partnerships, and I'm thrilled to be joining friends from the McCormick Graduate School of Policy and Global Studies, the Office of Alumni Engagement, and the Office of Career and Internships to kick off tonight's discussion on cultivating leaders for the public good, which is actually part of uh, a new initiative at UMass Boston. It's the first uh, event of this initiative called UMass Boston in Public Service, which is meant to lift up the people that are behind the public impact work. So many of our faculty, staff, students, and alumni are doing important work that impacts the public good through research, leadership, and service. Through university community partnerships, organizing and community development efforts, innovation and social change and high impact reforms spanning healthcare and the life sciences, education and human development, the environment, criminal justice, immigration, elder and disability issues among so many others. As Greater Boston's only public research university with the majority of our graduates being from and staying in the Commonwealth, it's only fitting that we better recognize the many contributions that people like Elizabeth and Leslie are making here and beyond. Nelson Mandela said, what counts in life is not the mere fact that we have lived. It is what difference we have made to the lives of others that will determine the significance of the life we lead. I'd like to add that at times like these, it is really calling us toward more public service that makes a difference. To this end, Dr. King would say to us, we are now faced with the fact that tomorrow is today. We are confronted with the fierce urgency of now. In this unfolding conundrum of life in history, there is such a thing as being too late. This is no time for apathy or complacency. This is a time for vigorous and positive action. So I wanna thank you for being here and engaging with us after a full day of Zoom, uh, but we hope that you enjoy the conversation and are inspired to make a difference and positive action to improve our world. And with that, I'd like to turn it back over to Dean David Cash to share more about tonight's agenda. Thank you so much again for being with us tonight. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Cynthia. And thanks for those, uh, those wonderful quotes uh, to start this off with. 
Uh, I'm going uh, to hand it over to our two students uh, who are essentially going to emcee the rest of the evening until we get to the very end. I'm really excited about that. And I, we should note this is a webinar format. So if you have any questions, put them in the chat or put them in the Q&A uh, buttons that you can see at the bottom of your screen. And our two students, uh, Liz Simpson, who's a doctoral student in the gerontology program, and Arika Bennett, who's a student in our gender leadership and public policy program, will be moderating the discussion later. So they will be uh, perusing the chats through and the Q&A uh, section throughout the evening. And uh, let me hand it over to, to Liz. Thank you so much, uh, Liz, for stepping up. We're really excited for the, for the discussion. Thank you, Dean Cash. Uh, hi, I am Liz Simpson, a fourth year student in the gerontology doctoral program here at UMass Boston. Um, I'm gonna introduce our first panelist, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Chen. She serves as the secretary of the Massachusetts Executive Office of Elder Affairs, where she heads the Commonwealth's effort to promote the independence, empowerment, and well-being of older people, individuals with disabilities, and their families. Prior to beginning her role with the Office of Elder Affairs, Dr. Chen served as assistant commissioner at the Massachusetts Department of Public Health, where she was responsible for the safety and quality of health care for Massachusetts residents seeking services in acute and long-term care settings. Dr. Chen has a truly varied professional background, working at the executive level in the pharmaceutical and biotech industries, then becoming president of the New England College of Optometry, despite, I believe, having no background in optometry. Uh, upon returning to school herself to pursue a master's degree from the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, she discovered uh, she had an interest in end of life issues, which led her to UMass Boston's doctoral program in gerontology. Here she completed her dissertation titled, Letting Go, the Influence of Clinicians and Proxy Decision Makers on Preferences for Life-Sustaining Treatments. Dr. Chen probably would not recall this, but she actually played an influential role in my own decision to apply for the gerontology program here. I was drawn to the program for its unique emphases on both research and policy, yet I was unsure about returning to school having been out of the academic environment for quite some time. In 2016, I attended the department's reception at the American Society on Aging Conference, where despite the pressure of finalizing and presenting her own dissertation work at the time, she sat with me, uh, listened to my concerns, my hopes, um, recommended faculty members that she thought would be appropriate and ultimately encouraged me to apply for the program. So Dr. Chen, welcome and thank you for being here with us today. We're looking forward to hearing more about your path to and in public service and leadership and the role of MGS in that path. Oh, that's fantastic. And thank you for reminding me about our conversation. Um, uh, at the annual meeting, that's so fantastic, and I'm so glad that you, you know, you're in your fourth year. This, yes, this is wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Well, thank you, Dean Cash, and to your team for the invitation. Um, I am always pleased to be invited back and to serve my alma mater. And I want to thank the Department of Gerontology and the Gerontology Institute for the excellent education when I was a student. Um, you know, I was so glad there was no ageism when I entered the program. I was 49 years old. <laughs> and so I was really glad that, you know, we, they walked the walk. Um, and uh, I'm most grateful uh, for the department's approach to teaching, which was to allow me to pursue my topic of interest. You know, so many graduate schools um, often ask you to follow a faculty member's interests. And, um, and here, I, as a mature student, I already had an area of interest. And I was just really grateful that I found um, a faculty that was very willing to let me explore my areas of passion. Um, and I have to say that um, it's probably harder and more work for faculty to let a student do that, especially when they wanna make sure that graduates have attained a, you know, appropriate grounding in core skills um, and um, appropriate grounding in some of the basics, uh, this, the fundamentals um, so that we don't embarrass the department or the school after we get out. Um, so I was asked to talk a little bit about how I ended up in public service. Um, 
and, and the role that McCormick played. So it was an aspiration, being in public service was an aspiration from 40 years ago, 40, 40 years ago, yes. And um, I finally found my way. It was a very circuitous path, but I found my way. So, um, you know, at the age of 17, believe it or not, I wrote my college entrance essay on the important role of public health and how access was key. And, and the reason I wrote that uh, essay was because I was a beneficiary of public health efforts. And I felt that I had a sense that not everyone had access. And I felt that it would be so wonderful if people had the, everybody who needed it had the access that I had. Um, you see, I'm an immigrant. Uh, we lived in subsidized housing in Boston. I received free school breakfast and lunch. I was on the breakfast and lunch program and I received free healthcare um, uh, from my local community health center in Chinatown. And, and I, I had this understanding that housing, food security and healthcare allowed my parents, my siblings and myself to thrive. And I had this sense that this was something that only government can do and that um, it, it can lift up lots of people. So um, then I went to college and my junior year in college, I, I realized that I couldn't afford to go into public service due to college debts and um, a future obligation, you know, really just knowing that I had a future obligation to support my parents in their old age. And so I pursued a career in business at my mother's suggestion. And so I spent about, you know, almost 20 years in business having, you know, I worked and then I went to get an MBA and then I worked some more. Um, then around 2010, I had a midlife crisis. I was just thought, oh my God, what is the meaning of life and what am I really doing um, with my career? And I decided to go back to school uh, to get a master's in public health. It was that master's in public health degree that I wanted to pursue in 1985, um, but couldn't. But now I'd reached the point in my life when I could afford both the time and the money to pursue this. And so I jokingly say that, you know, there goes my midlife crisis. It's, I spent a lot of money. It's better than buying a sports car, and it is certainly something that increases in value rather than decreases in value as you drive it off the, off the lot. Um, and, um, and so while I was pursuing my master's in public health, I found my passion there. Um, most of the education was about maternal fetal medicine about prevention, about health maintenance. And I thought, well, you know, you can prevent, 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 but there's an end to all this. And at some point people get sick and they can't get any better. And so what are we doing for people at the other end of life? Well, it turned out the more I learned about that, the more distressed I became. We were doing all the wrong things for people at the end of life. We were in some ways doing too much medical intervention and in some ways doing too little social and other types of intervention. So I decided to pursue a PhD, do more work in this area and get, and get myself deeper into this field. Um, and that's how I found UMass Boston. And it was, it was on a lark. Um, I knew I wanted to uh, study gerontology, um, but I, I'm not even sure I knew the academic name for the term. And literally, I googled something. I, I googled something like, you know, academic program studying old people. <laughs> It was just like, I really didn't know where to begin. <laughs> and, and through that process, lo and behold, I thought, 
oh my God, here it is in my backyard. And, you know, at that time and at that phase in my life, I was thinking, oh, how am I going to do this? Could I do remote programming? I'm not moving anywhere. I have a family. I have a child in school. You know, it, it's like nobody's moving. I'm staying here. And so I was really, really lucky to find the gerontology program and to find the more McCormick School. And um, it really was a wonderful, wonderful few years at the McCormick School. And again, I said the faculty were, you know, have just been fabulous and were fabulous in helping nurture what I wanted to study and, and the area of my passion while making sure that I developed the right skills and foundations and background to deserve that PhD at the end. Um, and I would say that in hindsight, I may have become assistant commissioner of the Department of Public Health with just my MPH, but I certainly, certainly, certainly would not be secretary of executive office of elder affairs without that PhD in gerontology. Um, I use it every single day on my job. I use it to advance what we do uh, in the Commonwealth. Um, it took me, you know, I started my job search really early. It took me about 18 months to land my first job in state government. And I, have, I was determined and single-minded about my networking my way in. Um, and I have to say, it should be easier. And we, we in state government don't make it easy. And certainly I'm doing everything I can to try to make it, make sure that we are open to bringing in new talent and open to, um, you know, bringing people in when they have a passion and a hunger for working in state government. The way our systems work is such that we, we have a position and, the external world comes in and you either fit or don't fit in that position. But what we really need to do is turn it around and say, you know, here's a wonderful person, very committed, and let's see how we can um, carve a position around that. And so um, that's my story. I am really glad you're all at the McCormick School. You're getting great education. And you have a wonderful network of alumni to help. All right, back to you. Great. Secretary Chen, thank you, thank you so, so much. much. It's such it's a fantastic, fantastic uh, pathway that you, that you took. Um, and um, here's some more details. I know Liz has, uh, has some great questions uh, in a moment. But now let's shift gears a little bit and let me quickly introduce Arika Bennett. She's a student in the Gender Leadership and Public Policy Program. Arika. Hi, everyone. My name is Arika Bennett. I'm a native and currently residing in Jackson, Mississippi, currently seeking a graduate certificate in the Gender Leadership and Public Policy Program at UMass. I chose the GLPP track because I have been doing youth civic engagement work through a Black queer feminist lens for quite some time and really wanted to be challenged in that way um, that would sharpen and deepen my analysis to shape my future plans to lead policy work in Mississippi. I have the pleasure of introducing a woman who has been in my shoes and blazing a trail for young Black women seeking to make change and doing the work for the people, former councilwoman Leslie Stevenson. Leslie has taken risks in, to improve communication in nonprofits, develop leaders in communities, and most recently analyze local data to enact policies that increase the quality of life in Norwood, part of Greater Cincinnati. Leslie moved to Ohio, to, from Ohio to Boston to study at UMass Boston Center for Women in Politics and Public Policy in 2015. She enrolled in the Gender Leadership and Public Policy Program, like I did, to bolster her skills and experience in public administration and policy. On January 1st, 2018, Leslie was sworn in as the first African-American member of Norwood City Council. Her passion for equitable outcomes is evident in her drive to collect data and include community members in data analysis and co-design improvements that benefit everyone. Leslie exhibits leadership by working towards shared responsibility when creating local solutions. 
inside organizations and in her community. Leslie is known for seeking understanding and empowering each person to know their role in policymaking. Leslie measures her impact and as a leader by noting whether results of her effort are sustainable or lead to necessary transformation. So Leslie, welcome and thank you for being with us today. I look forward to hearing more about you and your path to public service. Um, certainly a lot of the things that you have done align with everything that I'm interested in. So I'm excited to hear from you. Thank you for that beautiful introduction and um, thank you all for the opportunity to be here. It is quite a privilege to be able to reflect on the time that I've had to learn within the McCormick School and it's an honor to be able to share some of what has been a part of my path to public leadership with you all today. Um, for me, when I reflected on what my path has looked like, it, it started with the big questions. Um, I realized I spent a lot of time in my life thinking about who I am. And I, I, I often find that I resonate with leaders who have a strong sense of self and have really been able to overcome any type of internal barriers to identifying their self-worth or their purpose. And so for me, when I think about my path, I recognize, first of all, like I had to believe I have self-worth and that I have a God-given purpose and that that should drive how I spend my time. Uh, so when I thought about um, places that I could live, where I have lived, people I know, and, and, and really just settling, I get to define how I live my life. Um, I've come to a couple of thoughts. Um, one is, um, as a leader, especially a public leader, my presence is powerful because I know who I am. Um, one of the ways in which I describe myself, you may have seen in the registration bio information, is the relationship network I have. There are always have been and there always will be people who are central to my life, who help me um, stay committed to my sense of purpose. And that's meant a lot to me. If it wasn't for those people, my family, my friends, uh, my neighbors even, uh, really believing in me as I call out my sense of worth and purpose, I never would have left Ohio uh, to go into this program. I literally got rid of a lot of the things I owned, packed up a lot more of the things I owned and pursued at this academic opportunity because I knew there was something more I needed to know about in order to really take more of my um, next steps in public leadership. And so when I decided to join the Gender Leadership and Public Policy Program, uh, it really opened my eyes to more the historical context of women's leadership. I had always been a leader uh, from school age to community work, to even being involved in my church as a young person. Um, but the opportunity to really look at historical leadership for women, especially black women's leadership, um, while being encouraged to identify what policy priorities were important to me, that was one of the big value adds for me being a part of the center. And it really helped me um, identify, I needed time to think critically about policies. I needed time and space. Not that what I was doing with my life before wasn't valuable or meaningful, but I needed some more discreet training in order to consider implications of policy specifically for women of color and be able to identify how am I going to step into my purpose in this space? And so for me, the truth is conviction will always shape and set that compass for your path in leadership. Whatever you endeavor to do, I, I, I believe the truth is your convictions will always um, set your compass. Uh, after I went through a season, I mean, several years of really accepting my own self-worth and identifying with my sense of purpose, what I felt um, I was put on earth to do, I had to do the work of really kind of identifying, like, what am I called to do with my time? What am I called to do with my skills? Um, I'm grateful that I've been able to study at multiple universities. I hold a degree in mass communication, and I have a master's degree in human resource development. And the latter I acquired while I was serving um, as a national volunteer. I spent two years as an AmeriCorps VISTA in Greater Cincinnati, and I got to connect my personal interest in culinary arts to uh, community engagement and building up programming that help residents in an urban food desert uh, use their autonomy and use their access to uh, local gardening spaces to provide for their food needs. That taught me so much. Uh, when I think back on that time, 
it was really about learning I could persevere. Uh, I think at that point in my life, I knew what I was good at, but I didn't know what my capacity was. And so as I leaned into opportunity, new opportunities, it was really a matter of determining, can I persevere? Do I have enough faith in myself and the fruitfulness of my own work? And by the time I got to Boston and eventually Cambridge is where I lived, um, I was really committed to learning, but it didn't remove the barriers. So it took me months to find housing. It's actually um, one of my cohort members who connected me with a place to live for a little while. Um, but then I, it took me a while to find a job. And so I became very familiar with the campus resources that helped me navigate not only transportation, but access to food resources. And, and what I learned from my um, volunteer service here in Ohio really, I think, set the stage for me to recognize I can do hard things. And I'll, I think a lot of times the public leadership role, we think so much about the output of the work we do and just kind of the grind of it. Uh, for me, being in a discrete time of learning, it was really about synthesizing and figuring out how to leverage everything I knew about myself in these new opportunities. One of the things that I remember being able to do as a student was go to the AAUW's workshops um, in Boston. And I was reflecting on this with really a big smile on my face then. I sat through a negotiation workshop and I remember thinking, I am so glad for this train. Like these folks know I need it. I was able to get to it thankfully and then immediately use those skills. So throughout my time in the program, I had a chance to apply for many jobs and internships. And thankfully, I was able to use the training I received to negotiate enough funds to be able to pay rent, to be able to eventually buy food and not only rely on food pantries. It's really remarkable when I think back on it, because the truth for me is only when I focused on what was possible, did I really have enough momentum to persevere, believing that other people could see the leadership and the vision for women's leadership that I had. And that, I think, really grew out of settling. I'm called to do something with my life, and it's going to be hard work, so let's just do it. And the last thing I was thinking about um, with a lot of joy was I, I had to believe I could actually lead in policy development. And one of the things the center really spent a lot of time helping us focus on is there's a number of ways to engage with policymaking. Not everybody has to be a policymaker. Not everybody has to be in government. We need people in schools. We need people in homes. We need people everywhere who want to see good policy. And so as I began to settle, I can lead in policy development. What mattered most to me was doing it in a way that was authentic for me. And that, that really meant community engagement. It meant helping people figure out the system and where they could insert themselves. That really aligned with their values. To me, that's probably the most important part, important part of policy making. And it was really my cohort experience, being able to get feedback from faculty, from my peers, on my leadership, on my presence, how well I listened or didn't listen to ideas I did, I did or didn't like. All of that really helped shape me into a leader who people will talk to me and they'll ask me because they know I'll listen well. And I may not have the answer, but I'm seen as a resource. And so um, for me, that, that last bit of reflecting on the time that I spent in the program, it really helped me see another truth. And that, that for me was we're not always going to see what and who outlast our leadership, but we can do the work of investing in our leadership so that when people draw on us, they we're able to respond in ways that lead to the type of outcomes we want to see. So for me, um, being involved in the program, it was really icing on my search for finding how to get in my role. I had done community organizing, I had done grant writing, I had worked on state programming, and I was just kind of like, I think I want a different role. And I, and I really do see the center as being the space where I got a chance to figure out what role do I want to play in policy making so that I can feel good about the policies that intersect with my life. So thank you for listening and I look forward to the rest of our discussion tonight. Awesome, thank you so much, 
Leslie and the Grins. So, so great to hear your story after seeing you on campus years ago. So fantastic. Uh, I, I wanna make one clarification and then I'm gonna uh, pass it over to Liz and Arika for questions. Uh, Leslie kept on talking about the center and the, what, what she means by the center is the Center for Women in Politics and Public Policy, which was is one of the research and action centers that's within the McCormick Graduate School, but it's unique in that it also um, runs the Gender Leadership and Public Policy Program. So when you're in that program, you're also embedded in this center that automatically connects to communities uh, in and around Boston um, and uh, has access to internship programs and things like that. So. It's pretty unique. The whole program is unique in, in how it's centered in, in that center. Uh, so what, I'm just going to hand it over to, to Liz and Erika for Q&A. They're going to ask some questions. And then in 15 or 20 minutes, they're going to open it up to, uh, to the rest of you all. Cool. Thank you, Dean Cash. I'm so excited. Leslie. <laughs> oh, my God. Um, so, so much of everything you said is um, so much of where I am in trying to figure my life out. <laughs> um, and certainly this center has been very helpful in trying to help mold what I think I want to do into real life practice. Um, and a lot of that is centered in public good. And I like what you said around like convic convictions will set your compass. So um, for many of us, uh, public good can be defined in as many different things, depending on who you ask or what organization you work for and what the missions are, what field you're in. So I'm wondering for both you and Dr. Chen, what your idea was on what public good was coming into the center, post the center, and now that you're actually doing the work and how has that definition evolved and what does it mean for the way you show up every day? I used to think that um, I used to have a very negative view about uh, state government <laughs> uh, because when, when you think about it, you know, our interactions are like when we go to the RMV, right? And we're in a bad mood, we're in, a, in line, we're just like, that's sort of the front line interactions we have. Um, but through the McCormick School and through panels like this, you know, I became exposed to other people in state government. And I started to think, you know what? I think I'm, I think I wanna work in state government. <laughs> it's not, it's not, you know, it, it, I don't, I don't wanna say this disparagingly. It, it's not the RMV. I mean, <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, it's not like, you know, it's, it, it's, and, and, and it was really because of the, of these panels and I thought, wow, there, there's a lot of stuff that you can do and it's really interesting work. And what has been amazing to me is how hard people work and how smart people are and how committed they are to public service. So you get this energy every single day from the people you're around. And we have this energy and this determination, this collective determination to do the right thing. And, um, and so it's very inspiring. And I think for me at this point, I think it's a real privilege to be here, to be in the position that I'm in and to work in state government and to have the opportunity to do what I'm doing at this phase in my career. And again, I'm not disparaging the RMV. It's just, it's just that usually when I go, I'm, in, I'm already predisposed to be in a bad mood. <laughs> The, um, the thoughts that I had around public good prior to coming to McCormick uh, were shaped by the role I was in. I was a grant writer for a health department, and I remember distinctly going to a community knowing I wanted them to say yes to what we wanted to put in the grants. And I knew from my organizing days who led that community, and I knew this is not a person you tell anything to. This is a person who you have to ask permission. And I remember feeling like I want more of a connection to the people 
who I have the opportunity to work with so that I'm not, I'm not having to ask um, from a distance, but can rather co-create. So public good for me was, um, is very academic. And so when I came to UMass Boston, um, some of the literature reviews that I had a chance to sit with included a lot of material by Fox and Wallace. And what changed for me was looking at their analysis, I think it was the 107th Congress, and I found about the pathways they called out, like what were the careers people had before Congress? And I thought, I might know like 10 or 20 people who took those paths, and they weren't mine. And so for me, it became about um, figuring out how to reframe that narrative. To me, that became the public good. How do I make myself a viable candidate for shaping policy? And I think today, when I think about public good, it's really about resident leadership. And it's about ensuring that um, what I have seen as apathy in the policymaking process, uh, individuals role in the policymaking process, that that's not the end of the story. To me, the public good is we all know our part, whether that's we write a letter, make a phone call, we're running, um, or we're just sharing accurate information. Uh, so it's shaped a lot. I think right now I would say it's less academic, but it's, it's more collective. Thank you both. Um, Liz? Yeah, I guess I just wanted to make sure before we move on, if, if anybody would like to say anything more on that. Okay, if, um, Arika, if you don't mind, I'm gonna just swap the order of a couple of our questions. Um, I'm gonna move. Okay, um, so since we were talking about um, the centers and that played so prominently in your experience, Leslie, and I know in the gerontology department, we have um, the Institute that works to connect us also to the community. Um, I was wondering um, what community facing, facing initiatives you were involved in during your time with the McCormick School and how those, um, how those experiences prepared you for your public service. So I can start. I have a really unique experience as a student in that uh, Dean Cash uh, wanted to do some new things. And so I raised my hand. I actually spent time helping to organize social media for all of the centers. I had a part-time job where I got to go to events and tweet about them. And so I had kind of a front row seat to a number of things that were happening and it definitely boosted my social media skills. They were a lot better than, uh, than they are today. But it, I remember one of the things I did, so prior to finding a job, I, I got to do an internship with the center. And one of the outward facing things the center was doing the year I was there, the 15, 16 academic year, was lifting up the stories of women of color who had run for office throughout the state. And I remember literally being at the state house and on a, a dime, they were like, can you pitch in? And so I literally like ran the camera for this event. And I was like watching these voices speak about their experiences from school board to the state house. And I'm like tearing up. I'm like listening so intently, trying to follow along with the stories. And so it was very unique in that everything the center did had an outward touch point. And I got to see that while at the same time being in the classroom. And so, especially coming from out of state to be a part of the program, there was an immediate connection to um, the infrastructure of policymaking and who had already paved a path. And so for me, that was really unique. Well, I, I am embarrassed to say that I was very single-minded um, and totally focused on myself going through the McCormick School. <laughs> I, um, I was only taking in and not much was going out, unfortunately. Um, I, I took in every opportunity I could that was presented to students um, and, and you know, realized I was raising a family. My daughter was in high school. And, um, and, uh, 
and having a home and all of that. Uh, and also, I, I, I felt like I really wasn't getting any younger, and I needed to get through the program fast and to do it as fast as possible. So, so um, unfortunately, I wasn't really giving. <laughs> Well, I should mention, actually, one of Dr. Chen's claim to fame in our department is that she's the fastest to ever complete our PhD program. <laughs> so she certainly did that. <laughs> I, I want to chime in and just say that is commendable. I think probably the answer to my challenge question uh, is that you putting yourself first, whether that's with your family or as an individual, I I. I just want to lift up, thank you for focusing, because sometimes that's what is needed. And I think my greatest challenge is often being willing to say no to the other things, because I need this in order to take my next step. And so while it may have felt and maybe still does feel like you were being selfish, you can define it however you want to. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I heard, I, I focused on what I needed to focus on, and I, I can honestly say that was also my purview and oh. I mean when you get up and move and go somewhere it's not to go you know hit the bars it's to learn something <laughs> to accomplish something and so I I just want to affirm and 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 say kudos for setting a new record <laughs> thank you I'll give you a hug <laughs> oh. yeah I um I think part of what I hear a lot of um, my classmates in our cohort talking about just how strange it is being virtual and trying to like be involved, but also be very disciplined about the discipline. So <laughs> I'm also curious about like, you know, now that we are in this ever changing state of being virtual and Zoom is our new reality. Um, how is it that, um, I know Leslie, you talked a lot about how your network is really the centerpiece of how you've been super successful. So how has that changed in the midst of all that's happening and like, how has it affected or not affected um, the heights that you wanna reach in your career at this point? I've been working remote since March and I changed jobs in May. And that was one pivot that I think caused me to be most aware of a, of a change in, in supports. Um, throughout that time though, my family, my siblings, my parents and I, we actually started meeting on a more regular basis via Zoom. And I've had chances to connect with my extended family. We had a virtual family reunion and a virtual Thanksgiving. And so I'm grateful and thankful that, that the intention to stay connected in my interpersonal relationships is there. The, um, the role that I'm in now, so Health Path Foundation of Ohio is the fiscal agent for a community coalition that I lead. We are a drug-free, Drug-Free Community Support Program. It's a federal grant program that supports our work to build partnerships in our community that reduce and prevent substance abuse. And ironically, where a lot of people feel disconnected, my job is actually to talk to all of my neighbors. And so I don't actually feel any setback. If anything, it's been a narrowing of my focus. And so if I talk to a coworker, in the coalition, if they don't live in the city, which is 3.1 square miles, um, they work in the city. And so it's almost um, clarified what is possible through leading right where I live and really focusing in on not just resident leadership, but how to relevantly respond to what's going on in our neighbors' lives in, in a meaningful way at this time. I think the biggest change um, that I've observed is that we, in in this time, in these pandemic times, we don't have the casual, informal, stop by, how are you doing, passing in the hallways, what's going on, um, the you know, pop in the you know, pop into Dean Cash's office, you know, hey, just want to say hi. Um, everything is scheduled. And so there's an appointment for Zoom. There's this event, there's that event. So, so that spontaneity is, is not there. And I think we've lost something in not having that spontaneity. Um, on the other hand, um, 
we have onboarded some people at Elder Affairs and I've learned um, also from my daughter who graduated from college and is being onboarded, has been onboarded um, uh, to a company, um, Liberty Mutual, an insurance company. So I've been observing how people are using, companies and employers are using technology it more intentionally in onboarding. And so I think that's that's a benefit because we're working harder to integrate new people because we know it's harder when you're not passing by in the hallways. And so we're more intentional and more precise. And I think that's a, that's a benefit. And I think this is a practice that will carry over in the future. Thank you both. Um, I just got the five minutes until we're moving into the open question session warning. So um, this will be the last question. Um, since part of this panel is focusing on leadership, um, we also wanted to know if you would speak to what experiences or aspects of your time um, at MGS prepared you for leadership specifically in public service. I can share um, some very specific examples. Um, I remember having a project in one of my classes where I had to uh, create a policy recommendation. And everything from learning the structure, I see that head shake, Rika. <laughs> everything from like learning the structure of like what the faculty expected to uh, identifying and vetting my resources to, you know, making sure it was a balanced recommendation. Uh, I took that, worked through that. I don't think I got an A on it, but the next job I got, um, I was asked, can you, can you draft some language? We're supposed to put in a statement of confidence around this policy issue. And I was like, mm -hmm, I know how to do that. And so I immediately started looking for resources, like, well, what's the data on this issue so I can put this together? And um, that was really telling for me in, in terms of I had not only had instruction, but I had gotten enough feedback to know this is where you start with the data and the landscape of where you're wanting to create this policy, not just how it works for an organization or even um, the most vocal champion. Another very brief example, when I served on the Orange City Council, a lot of times there were questions the public had and even fellow council members around, how do we know we're doing the right thing or the best thing? And one of the things I learned through, through my time in, in the Corvic, it, it definitely showed up in the center, but in other opportunities I had there as well, uh, was to do some comparative data. Um, a very specific example, um, not just learning the landscape, but I remember calling another city in Ohio and saying, I need you to talk to me about how you set the salary, the performance benchmarks, and what you do to ensure like this position in government is doing its job. And it was kind of peculiar. Uh, I think it was like in the middle of getting my hair done, I left my appointment and got on the phone with like the service director and HR person at this other city because I needed to be prepared for going to this next meeting. And, and I recognize the value of preparation through my program. That's great. So you know, because I was in a PhD program, I don't think that the leadership skills that are taught in master's professional programs are, are in, in the same way. Um, uh, but having been through uh, two master's professionals programs, um, I, <laughs> as I said, it was a long and windy path and I just did it the hard way. Um, I, I have to say that um, I, I valued a couple of things from both my MBA and MPH programs that I continue to use every single day. Um, the first is public speaking. Uh, the, you know, I had a course in my MBA program where you just stand up and talk. They give you, you know, a topic and you just have to, you just have to do it. Um, and then a, a writing course. How do you distill everything you want to say into two thirds of a page? 
because the top part is the memo and who is it to and the date and all of that. And you have to distill all your thinking to two thirds of a page. And that has become very, very useful and important. And I continue to try to teach it in my management team. Um, and then the third piece that's really important is that I had a course um, at Harvard on leadership and leadership development. And it was a course where it was all about a self-diagnostic, who are you? What do you stand for? What are your passions and priorities? And then you try to express yourself. And, and then there was, a, there, there, there was a whole uh, back and forth in the classroom of peer, um, peer coaching and peer response. And I remember there was, um, there was, there was one person uh, who very, very tall and I was sitting in the front row and he was very emphatic and passionate about what he was talking about. And afterwards, my, my feedback to him was, you know, I was really scared because you're standing right over me, towering over me. And I thought you were going to hit me with your elbow. And so, and, and so that was really important feedback to him. And it taught me how to give feedback. And he heard something he normally wouldn't hear. So that process in a classroom is really, really important. It's true. You don't always um, learn what you think you're going to learn. And sometimes those things are the most useful things. Um, I think now would be time to move into the question and answer. And um, Arika, if it's okay, there's, there are, there's two questions from, I hope I'm saying this correctly, Sophia in the question and answer box. Um, the first one is specifically for Dr. Chen. And the second one I think can apply to both of you. So the first question is, um, can you say a bit more about the application and hiring process to secure a non-academic job in Boston? Uh, she's a PhD candidate and wants to work in public service. And following on to that, just what advice would you give to PhD graduates hoping to follow in a similar path? And Leslie, I think you could also speak to this for, for graduates of your program as well. Yeah. Uh I would say that if you want to work in state government, go to mass.gov and we list our jobs. Uh, and there's a trick I didn't know when I applied for those jobs. Um, we cut off we cut off reviews after 14 days because we get so many resumes. We only look at the first 14 days unless we don't have enough resumes. <laughs> so nobody told me this secret. <laughs> and so it clearly, the, the job is posted, it has the date of posting. So if you see something that's just aged too long, I, I, just, I just don't bother. Um, but it gives you a sense for what each department needs. And it gives you a sense, you know, it, it helps you understand the operations of each of the departments and each of the areas. And it helps you frame what you want to do and how you want to shape your resume and how you want to shape your, um, your informal contacts and your networking. Because through that process of looking at these jobs, you start to pick out what appeals to you. Um, and, and it really can help because, you know, like every major employer, I mean, the state is an employer of 43,000 people. Like every employer, we have our own language. We have, you know, our, our bizarre ways of naming departments and it doesn't normally make sense. So, but you develop a, you develop a, a feel for it by just going to that website. So that's that. Um, that would be my first piece of advice. <laughs> Speaking of advice, um, somebody, I think it's Jean, wants to know if you both could speak to the process of your studies and the reality of applying applying it to your career. Um, just some advice for newbies, somebody who is really interested in this field. 
Leslie, I'll let you go first. Thank you. The, um, the advice, um, gosh, I think I said this for the incoming class um, of GLPP, um, get out there, do everything you can do while you're a student. And, and, and that's part of being focused, I think. The, um, the phrase that came to mind when I thought about all the things I tried to do, I felt like my time in the corner was like an incubator where if it was for students, I was there. I mean, all the times I could go over to anything that was happening over at that Senate building, I was like, I'm going. I signed up for conferences. I didn't know anything about, I just thought I'm gonna go and learn. And I learned about housing. That was quite riveting. I was like, I don't think I can live here for, for much longer. Uh, but everything that you can get involved in and that 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 helps shape what I care about. I, I know I care about housing now. I didn't know that before. And, and being able to get some insights there. Um, it was definitely classwork, center events, school events, program events. And I think it's not just about going, make time to reflect. I had a life mission statement and a life vision statement before I came to McCormick. And when I left, I had a list of values and how I wanted to see those show up in my work. And that, that really centered me to be able to identify what I want to do. And just to speak to um, what Secretary Chen is saying about um, mass.gov, I applied for a ton of jobs. I had an interview to be a grant writer, I think with the treasury office. Interview went great, but I was kind of looking around like, I don't know if I want to work here. This may not be the language I want to use. I don't know if I want to go in these weeds. And, and I looked around public health a lot too, and had a job interview to be a data analyst. And I knew I can do this job, but what I felt was it's not going to connect me to people. And I knew I wanted my role in policymaking to connect me with people, even though I cared about public health. And so for me, I would say the advice is do everything you can, but make time to reflect on it and be sure you know what does it mean to you and for you and how you want to leverage that experience to talk about not just what's important to you, but what part you want to play in policymaking. I would say that's fantastic advice, you know, you, which is you're, you're being true to yourself. And after every interview, you really should reassess and say, you know, it's not about them choosing you, it's about you choosing them. And it's very hard to keep that in mind. In, in, in a job searching is just a brutal process. And it's very hard to maintain that sense of confidence find a buddy find a buddy somebody you can talk to about every attempt and how it went i think that's a good approach um, as well and even though i think someone mentioned like yeah things will be virtual for a while go to virtual events this is going to be our new normal for a long time so uh, i i think they're just as valuable Thank you. That's really great advice. They do say if you go to a job interview, you're also interviewing them. So <laughs> um, I think a good follow up to this question would be the, um, the question from Patrice. Um, there's sort of it's sort of a, a one for each of you question. Uh, Patrice would like Dr. Chen's suggestion on writing workshops in the public policy area, if you know of any or if anybody knows of any um, at UMass Boston as well. Um, and uh, if Leslie could recommend one resource in the center that proved most useful, useful from a networking perspective, um, keeping in mind that we'll be remote for the foreseeable future. And uh, Patrice would also like to note that you are both so inspiring and helpful. <laughs> <laughs> oh, great. So um, I have a book uh, here. This is the book. You don't need a seminar. This is your book. <laughs> And it goes through, it goes through um, awkward sentences and clear sentences, and then how to revise them into clear sentences. Um, and you know, it's um, writing clearly is a lifelong process. And one of my professors. Um, Jan, where's Jan Mutchler? I thought I saw her on this. Jan Mutchler 
used to write uh, her her in the in the comments. Um, <laughs> this sentence is not very clear, and it reflects that you are not very clear about how you are thinking about this concept or this particular idea. And so it's this wrestling that you have to do to get it really tight, to convey what you mean. And if it's all mucked up in here, it comes out all mucked up. And so, um, and, and so I, I also would say you need to put it down and the beautiful thing now is that you can have Word read it to you. And if you just close your eyes and have Word read it to you, and if you can't understand yourself, then just you need to rewrite it. <laughs> that is great, great advice. And I, I wanna add to that. I was recently reflecting on an experience where clarity wasn't in what was written or what was said. And it actually caused me to think I was witnessing the fullness of the other person's capacity, which wasn't true. And so I just wanna, I'm telling this to myself, yes, communication, lifelong skill development. Elizabeth, can you repeat the second question you had? Actually, it disappeared, but I believe it was, <laughs> I believe, well, actually, wait, maybe it's in this other one. I want to make sure I get it right. Um, you see it. There we go. Yep, an answer. Okay, here we go. If you could recommend one resource in the center that proved most useful from a networking perspective. So um, a, a name and then a thing. So a name, um, Muna Killingback. Uh, Muna is everything. Uh, that is a true statement. And Muna connected me to everything. And the great thing about being virtual is Muna will email you. She will email you and tell you exactly what you need to do, who you need to talk to. And um, Muna has heard me say this multiple times. I would not have come and I would not have stayed without Muna. So talk to Muna. She will help you figure it out. And um, the other thing I would say is actually Twitter. So in my time in the center, we actually had a networking event. And I know this because my job was to literally stand at the door and say, you cannot come into this event until you tweet at us. That was your entrance. And it really made a difference, I think, for, for me to know who were the other colleagues in my cohort. But also, it was a great way to follow research, to follow what was actually um, trending in, in leadership and women's leadership and different policy issues. So. Luna Kelly back and tweet. I love that. I am an avid Twitter phenomenon. Love it. Um, so we, all of you, both of you have talked about clarity and um, my mom always says, and all of you are getting, getting understanding and I will be the first person to back you up about Muna. Um, and it seems like both of you have very non-traditional backgrounds and entrances into this program or into your respective programs. So this next question um, is about speaking to women who may not be able to pursue the course on gender leadership and public policy and how they can explore more opportunities through volunteering in order to find a path towards um, public leadership. So I think that's a really round question, but it's a really good one. Secretary Chen. Yeah, I think volunteering um, is incredible experience and people, we, we always need volunteers in our community organizations. And so I think it's a great place to become engaged, to test out new things, um, new roles, um, to just try new areas and see. I, I, I strongly, strongly encourage volunteering. And you know, it gives back, you feel good about yourself and you get lots and lots of positive feedback. So there's no reason not to do it. That is so, so my feeling as well. If you, if you want to lead in any capacity, volunteer first. That is my philosophy. Um, being in AmeriCorps really started my path to public leadership. 
And as an AmeriCorps VISTA, I design volunteer programs. And one of the things I always ask volunteers is, what are the skills you're looking to build? And I expected them to tell me something so that I could design the volunteer position to benefit them. Um, one of the very practical things I've done is um, when I'm job seeking or really just thinking about skill development is uh, find a way to identify the skills you want to be able to exhibit one day, whether that's in the job description or um, maybe you're reading someone's bio and you're like, oh, that's cool. I want to do that one day. And then find a way to volunteer and do that. Um, if you're not able to go into a course of study, that is one thing I would highly recommend. Um, ask to audit a class, um, especially now that they're virtual. It might be more affordable. Um, it might also be something that you can do to give back. Um, I imagine everyone who's listening has some skill, experience, something that you can use to teach others. And so find a way to leverage that. And then the final thing I would say is read. Read, 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 read. Um, in addition to the physical act of volunteering, I, I was able to read the stories of other people, other women in particular, and that really got my wheel spinning around. What might I want to do and how might I get there one day? Thank you both. Somebody in the chat has a really interesting question too about um, what the pillars of your personal leadership style are. I could start with... Um, what I, what I had in mind when I thought about becoming a council member, uh, first and foremost, it was I, I wanted just outcomes um, or, or I wanted equitable outcomes. And I thought, gosh, if, if things are going to be equitable, then they have to be just. And so for me, it was how do, how do, I, how do I embody just decision making? And I think sometimes that starts with integrity that looks like transparency. Um, I also had a very strong focus on uh, shared responsibility. You heard that when Arika introduced me. I, I have had the experience of being given solutions and having had the experience of building solutions. And to me, when we share responsibility for solutions, they're, they're more sustainable. And, and really, um, in between sharing and building the solutions and sustaining them, another pillar for me would be they got to be understandable. I, I spend a lot of time thinking about how, how I utilize data, but more importantly, how do people understand it? So that um, I'm not perceived as someone who's acting upon other people. Um, and also so that I and others can understand the data or the research, whether it's a story or a number about my own experience. So I would say those were those are things I've had in mind, especially during my time on city council, um, just, equitable, how is it being a shared solution? Are we all understanding it? And then can we sustain it? And so thank you, Leslie, for giving me time to think. So, <laughs> um, you know, when I lead, I live by a few principles. Uh, one is humility. First is humility. Um, I, and, and the second is responsibility. I apologize when that's needed and you apologize quickly and you own what, what you're supposed to have done. And, um, and it goes a long, long way. And um, I also practice kindness. Um, there just isn't enough of that in the world. And certainly ha having been in business for 20 years, it just wasn't really valued being kind to each other on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think one of the, the beauties of being in state government is that you can do that and it is valued. And it's, 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 a, it's great. Isn't it great to work in a place where we're all just trying to be kind to each other and look after each other and to do very well in our jobs. So it's not either or. And so I think these are really important things to live by. And with that, I think we're running out of time. Are we? Okay. We are indeed. Uh, we got the message that it is um, time for final thoughts. And we did have um, 
We did have someone shoot a question in the chat about um, something that you're proud of. So if you'd like to try to incorporate in that in there, then um, you would be welcome to. <laughs> Can I go first? Okay. So um, I, I think what comes to mind repeatedly, and I'm probably a little older than you think I am, but what comes to mind repeatedly when I think about leadership experiences, um, I'm really proud of the fact that I didn't quit. I think there are a lot of times when um, I've been presented opportunities to lead and my personal desire is I want X, Y, Z outcome. And I don't get to control all the variables to get there. Um, I remind myself often, Leslie, and I use my name, you will never have the power to control another person ever. Like you might think you can get that, but you can't. And so I have really worked hard to manage and self-regulate, to really stay focused on just don't quit. Just don't quit. Um, I think the leaders who I most respect, most admire, most enjoy being around are people who have courage. And um, that's, that's really important to me to help myself believe that about me, that I can persevere, and, and I would say in, in serving in a role where no one else had did what I was doing, um, there were a lot of times I wanted to quit. And I remember one time in particular, I called my dad and I said to him, I know exactly what I wanna say, so I'm gonna tell you, mm -hmm. because I can never go out to a public meeting and say this. And that was refreshing. And then I went to the grocery store and kept it moving. But um, I didn't quit. And I think it's okay to acknowledge sometimes that is the thing to be most proud of, that you chose to keep it moving. Oh, that's great. Yes, don't quit. Don't quit. Keep moving. Keep moving. Um, and I'm most proud of um, having brought up a daughter and I would say to young people everywhere, um, yes, I'm proud of my career, but boy, I'm even more proud of having brought up a daughter. Do not, do not give up that part of your life in, in exchange for pursuing a career. And, and I grew up at a time when lots of people did, lots of women did. Uh, I grew up in my career in that time. And I'm really glad I, I, was give, I had the opportunity to have a child. I feel like I made a mistake in not having more children. I wish I had a gaggle. Um, and that we are now all living so long. There is no reason why we shouldn't devote time to families. We need to do that. We should do that in all the forms that exist. Um, first mute fail and it was me. <laughs> um, Dean Cash, is it, uh, what's the next step? Yeah, well, if you, if, if uh, it would be great to hear Liz and Erika, what inspired you tonight? And then we're gonna shift to uh, uh, Associate Dean Adozi and, and PK from the career. Erika, why don't you go? That was sweet to put me on the spot, Liz. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, I think everything that Dr. Chen and Leslie have shared tonight have been very useful for me. Um, I run a nonprofit organization that I'm trying to like center in social justice movement and be very value centered and mindful of young people in building this larger movement. Um, and also doing that through like a very feminist lens. And it's just a lot of people to center when you wanna be intentional. Um, and you also have to center yourself and your story and who you are and um, know that at the end of the day that you've made decisions out of clarity and intentionality and in hope for the good for the future of whatever work you want to do and be up to. So um, to hear both Dr. Chen and Leslie have been like a breath of fresh air. I feel like I'm doing the right thing. Um, I finally, like after finding GLPP, after long Google searches, I finally feel like I see a program who sees me and is um, really speaking to the things that I wanted to learn. I don't come from a public policy background. I have a degree in 
chemistry and physics, but here we are. Um, and I'm really excited to just learn more and grow um, with the folks in my cohort. So thank you for having me tonight. This was beautiful. Yeah, I felt really privileged to be able to take part in this and I appreciate the invitation. Um, and I think it's worth noting that this is a panel of incredible, powerful, passionate women. <laughs> um, and I think, I hope that we've all been as inspired by your energy um, and commitment as, as I have been and I believe Arika has been. Um, and obviously we're not done yet. I wish you the, both the best of luck in the future. Thank you so much, uh, Secretary Chen and, and Leslie and Arika and uh, Liz. Oh my goodness, I am, I am so inspired by this. I spend so much of my time in administration and I will say I don't spend enough time listening to our students and to our alums because your stories of strength and power and intellect and stick to are just unbelievable. So thank you very much for that. Let's close up with uh, our Associate Dean, Kiki Adozi, an architect of the student support programs at McCormick and the academic programs and uh, worked hand in hand with all of us here in developing uh, tonight. So uh, Kiki Adozi and uh, Matt from the Career Services Office, bring us on home. I'm going to hand it over to um, Matt uh, PK first, and then I'll close up with uh, closing comments. Go ahead, PK. Thank you all so much. <clears throat> it's been such a pleasure to be a part of this and um, to really, you know, again, hear the real life stories of, of alum and, and the impact that the work that McCormick and UMass Boston is doing in impacting, you know, public service and, and being the leaders in, in doing this. I want to share two quick things uh, with folks. So I'm going to share my screen because there was there was some themes that were shared here that were all career related. And I want you all to be aware of this, um, what we are calling career readiness. So I'm gonna show you this slide, but if you notice there were a lot of critical words here that were brought up in what it's like to be a public servant, what's necessary, leadership was often talked about, right? We talked about oral and written communication, professionalism and work ethic, work ethic that grit, that that stick to itness to, to, to overcome obstacles and, and, and challenges, right? Because let's be honest, looking for a job is a job. It is challenging. Um, and as Dr. Chen mentioned, it's something that it, it, you really do have to, to hang in there and have that support network of people there also maybe going through it with you or able to support you and say, it's okay. Well, the big ta-da is that that is what we are here for in career services. We are here and, and, and the majority of you, if you are UMass Boston students or alumni, you've already bought and paid for us. And we are a free lifetime membership. So that's something that we wanted you all to be aware of. Um, but again, I just wanted to highlight these critical um, skills, which we're calling the career readiness core competencies. This is something that all employers are looking for. So if you plan on going into a career field in public service, Please make sure that you're honing and able to talk about these critical skills and how you're able to demonstrate. Lastly, I'm gonna leave you with this. We have a jobs database called Handshake with over 7,000 jobs that are specifically listed there for UMass Boston students. These are individuals that want to recruit our talented, diverse and powerful uh, students with over 200 internships listed. As I mentioned, you all have lifetime membership as an alumni uh, or a current student. And this goes obviously for our undergrads as well as you're thinking forward about your next career and, and future steps. We're here to help you with a resume, cover letter, mock interview, career planning, and more. And we just wanted to let students know that students and alumni that utilize our services are five times more likely to land a job six months later than students who do not. So it behooves you to take advantage of our resources. I'll now turn it back over to um, Dean Kiki. Thank you, thank you so much, PK. Uh, what a fascinating um, capstone experience and ending to this uh, fascinating event. Um, you know, I hope uh, Secretary Chen and um, Councilwoman uh, Stevenson remember your capstone experiences <laughs> and, and you know, the theses and um, uh, courses that you took here. 
Um, that's what PK has done. I, I found this event, you know, really fascinating. It was interesting. It was um, informative. It was uh, a dynamic conversation. I, you know, I just love the way that um, we've matched up current students to former students and current, uh, you know, alum in uh, moderating the Q&A. And, you know, it felt like, um, for me, a, a circular moment in uh, generational educational journeys. Um, I heard from Secretary Chen uh, very distinctive memories of pedagogical classroom ciphers <laughs> and from Councilwoman Stevenson, her rendition of her first time experience in extracurricular uh, training of the power in social media. Um, so let me close by providing a long list of thank yous uh, and appreciations to all of you this evening, um, starting with uh, Dean David Cash for being, um, you know, what he's well known for actually, his nickname is uh, being an entrepreneurial dean, the most entrepreneurial dean on campus. He's um, a dean that, you know, extends <clears throat> his academic leadership to a community outreach. And you have seen <laughs> how he has done that um, today. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Cynthia, um, Orlana, uh, who is the uh, director of our uh, community partnerships at UMass Boston. Um, she is a, a, a bridge builder, a creative servant, a leader, a collaborator, and you've seen how she has brought, you know, by inspiration of this event, um, you know, all of us together today. Thank you, uh, Cynthia. Um, Secretary Elizabeth Chen, um, alum <laughs> and current secretary, um, uh, you began your tenure um, as Secretary of the Massachusetts Ex Executive Office of Elder Affairs in uh, June uh, 2019. Congratulations. And um, you are such a role model. And, and thank you for joining us today and sharing your really interesting experiences uh, for Path Forward uh, for our students. Um, and um, I'd love to thank, uh, you know, as well, Councilwoman uh, Leslie Stevenson, um, 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 uh, uh, an alum of our graduate certificate in gender leadership and public policy. Um, and she used to be also the project coordinator um, at Health Plan, uh, the foundation of um, Ohio. Um, so congratulations. She is also um, sworn in as the first African-American uh, member of the Norwood City Council. Uh, thank you, um, you know, St um, Councilwoman Stevenson for joining us um, and sharing your really intimate but really um, path-breaking experiences, um, certainly for our students. Uh, I'd like to thank to our student moderators, um, Elizabeth Simpson, who is a current doctoral student uh, in gerontology, um, and um, Arikia Bennett, who is a current uh, graduate certificate um, a student in gender leadership and public policy in the Department of Public Policy. Um, congratulations to both of you. What a fantastic moderation. Um, but I also saw, you know, the ways in which um, the experiences of our alum have sort of uh, illuminated your own experiences and inspired you uh, to move forward. Um, finally, thank you to, um, we call him PK, Matthew Power Koch who is the manager of university internships um, in the Office of Career Services and Internships. Um, and thank you, you know, for, you know, inspiring us at the end, you know, and connecting the dots. Um, thank you to two people who are behind the scenes who you don't see here, but this event would not have been possible without them. Um, and that is Rochelle A. Stryker. She is our director of events and academic programs and uh, Jack Lee is her program assistant. Thank you both. Thank you all, you know, all your, the, the audiences to, um, you know, for spending your evening with us uh, this evening. Look out for more community partnership um, events uh, with alum um, sponsored by UMass Boston. Thank you all, have a good evening, uh, go safe, <laughs> thank you.